Okay, so the name of this uh, lecture and act, uh, practice practicum is mapping for active tectonics. And so the the first point is just we need remote sensing data. And so remote sensing is, you know, it, it's we say objective, multi-resolution, multi-spectral, multi-temporal. So what that means is objective is that it's taken from afar. There's no judgment. It's just this what you see. Multi-resolution is the critical issue for us. It's how big the representation on the ground is of the target. So 90 meters or one meter. In general, higher resolution is better. And then the uh, final point is multi-temporal. So change, we can measure change by repeat remote sensing. And this, and we'll talk about more in uh, future lectures, especially with the LIDAR. And so we're most familiar with uh, Google Earth. So Google Earth, you know, has lots of data that's high quality. This is the uh, area around Jokja, right? And so uh, this is we're all quite familiar with. And this is really revolutionary, right? That in just, you know, a few years, anyone can see such good pictures of the Earth, right? It's incredible. And it's free, and so, you know, you can drill down, and my computer's slow right now, but it's uh, multi-resolution, so uh, most of this is from digital globe, so satellite high-resolution data. You can see, at, if I go out, you see the other uh, spot image is there, so this is maybe somewhat more like five meters per pixel, but as I zoom in, then it's only the the high resolution from digital globe and as you know it's it makes a pyramid of data so as we zoom in it gets finer and finer resolution over the internet so that's the other revolutionary aspect of google earth is it gives you just what you need and no more and so it can go over low bandwidth uh, situations so we're all familiar with this remote sensing and this is google earth is a very good tool but it's not always precise enough in terms of some functionality, so that's why we use ArcGIS or MapInfo. So maybe everybody knows remote sensing, but for uh, we just talked about radar, so this would be really an active remote sensing method where we shoot some energy out and get the reflection. But other methods, other parts of the spectrum may be visible, near-infrared or infrared, are really taking reflection or emission of the ground surface. And depending on which part of the spectrum you look at, you can get more different information about the ground, like rock rock composition is in thermal infrared. Near infrared is quite sensitive to vegetation. And we see in uh, visible, so uh, more topography is the kind of most thing we see in our own structures. So here's just a picture of... Uh, of a city, this is Phoenix, from different band combinations. And so maybe if you know for satellite imagery, you use the red, green, blue. And so what this means is the band for this channel in the Aster, or this is Landsat, is the one that has the near infrared high re emission from vegetation. And since it's in the red channel, RGB, this area shows the lots of vegetation in that the desert and then 745 just coming around um, and 753 this seven would be out in more of the long, long wave like infrared so it's more sensitive to the rock characteristics and so we see some different units maybe in the bedrock here so that's just quick remote sensing you know you can take a whole class on remote sensing right so uh, I can only do uh, one minute. <laughs> so, uh, but one thing we use a lot is aerial photography for our active fault studies for a few reasons. The first reason is that uh, it's high resolution. So aerial photographs may, uh, because especially if it's a photograph and it's taken from an airplane, may have ability to represent features on the Earth's surface of 50 centimeters or less typically. Uh, you know, if you have like a low altitude area photography, it can be one centimeter. And 
usually the aerial photography is it's flown like this where the plane is flying along it takes a picture moves some distance takes another picture and so we get a sequence of aerial photographs with some overlap traditional uh, and this is useful it, it it also another advantage of aerial photography is it's been collected for almost 100 years in many places so i know uh, for example Gatri, the air photos you got are from when 1995 so and they're uh, Indonesian government, yeah. yeah. And so also, isn't there 1940s from like military World War II air photos? You can't get them. Yeah. Hard, okay. Yeah. So historic aerial photography is really useful because um, sometimes it's you know there's much fewer, many fewer people there, and so you can see what the natural environment was like. And also, um, it, the quality of the, even the old air photos can be quite high. Gray scale air photos from 1940 still can be so useful. And that's actually my personal story. I became a geologist because I worked in an aerial photography library and I was always looking in the air photos and I always thought it was so amazing. So that's why I love air photos. So, but now, but now modern, you can do stereo color and so this just shows the bridge and it's repeated but because the picture was taken from two different places of the same target it's like our eyes that's why we can see depth and uh, because of the parallax the displacement of features in the image uh, is a function of their height and so here's um, an example you can really see this parallax this cooling towers you see this picture was taken maybe from the left a little bit and so the towers are leaning a little bit to the right but then the plane continued to fly and it took another picture and you see the towers look like they're leaning left so that's parallax and your brain really likes parallax because we can process it to get 3d so if you need basically you need to put one image in one eye and then the other image in the other and your brain does the combination so this just shows geometry of aerial photography so we can use quantitative information from air photos and so stereoscopic viewing so echo loaned us this really nice stereo viewer which we'll look at later this machine right here and uh, you can just hold up those air photos right there so these are classical just hold them up so people can see these would be not uh they call uh, yeah so this is Lembang Fault or North Bandung in 1995 or 1999, aerial photography, black and white. And uh, this is kind of a classic, these are called nine inch air photos. So, and the big, large format, so they're a big negative, so it can get lots and lots of information. So that's that. So then you can also use uh, photogrammetry. We can use this in the computer and we can compute a model of the topography that best explains the parallax. And in one of our future exercises, maybe next week, we'll play around with this. We'll make our own digital elevation models from some images that we can maybe take ourselves. So I'm going to keep going. Okay, there's nine-inch air poles just like these. These are from Spain, but same thing. If you get them, it's always important to... Make sure you keep information on the side here. And then this little tick here, this one, this one, gives some information about the, the camera usually. And for some quantitative work, like if we want to use photogrammetric methods, we need to know the camera information. So uh, sometimes I've made a mistake before where I just scanned the middle of the air photo. I was like, oh, all I need is this. And then I got this one and I threw away the boundary information and this was bad so always scan the whole thing the problem is of course that most scanners are less width than those air photos so it's very annoying uh, because you know how do you get the whole air photo scan so you need a big scanner or careful reconstruction in photoshop so yeah it shows the uh, data strip camera length fiducial mark and overlap so when we come to mapping, uh, you know, let's just go forward. This is uh, where we, uh, where 
I, we teach, this is our university, so it's a desert, there's a football stadium. So you can see already this is the university, it's, the buildings are bigger, right? And then these must be some houses. And you can see here, you see there's green, more green. So this is older place, and in the desert it's kind of maybe more wealthy people because you have lots of water, you have more vegetation. So, uh, so you can tell a lot from aerial photography or imagery. This is Google Earth, but the same. You see this very strange thing we have here. It's a lake. There's a uh, dam here and a dam there. And so they filled the river, which is dry. They put water in, but they had a dam either side. So this is a, an amenity so people go and swim or go on boats. And then here you can see the rocks of this park, golf course, and so on. So, you know, how do I know what is here? Of course, I live there, but it's also you can tell because of these different things, the shape, size, pattern, tone, texture, shadowing, association, resolution, and target. So all of these are uh, considerations when we look at aerial photography, and it's really powerful. So, you know, sometimes you can take, especially if in a geography department, you may spend an entire class just on aerial photography interpretation. And also traditionally in like military, like an army, they will have a air photo interpretation because uh, it's useful to an anticipate what is going on in some place. Okay, so when we, okay, so any questions before I go to the next subject? Okay, so mapping is most important. And remember, I think, I, I forgot your name. What What is your name? Yudhikara. So you asked a good question. You said, well, what do we do? I see some cracks. And I my answer was, well, you have to map. Just map everything, and you get the context. And so, uh, so, but there's different kinds of mapping. So this is my main message from this lecture. We're mostly used to regular geologic mapping. So we map, you know, this is a granite, this is some conglomerate, this is some uh, houses, you know. But other kinds of mapping we can do are geomorphic mapping. So we, what are the landforms? So this is a river, this is a mountain, this is a flat area. So it's not the geology, it's the shape of the landscape. And another special kind of geologic mapping is the young unit. So usually when you talk to a traditional geologist, they will say, oh, I, I can map three different granite units and two different volcanic rocks and some limestone, but I just mapped all of the valley as one thing. You know, all the alluvium is just uh, one unit. But instead, when we do the quaternary geologic mapping, we usually lump all the bedrock. We just say it's all bedrock. We don't care what it is. And we have many units in the valley. So this is different terraces coming down. And so mapping, you have to know, you have, you kind of have to know what question you're asking to help define what the mapping is. So I always say I can't map on anything unless I, or I can't work on anything unless I map it first. And the mapping is the most useful data that you can bring back. So my mapping mantras is, uh, you know, thinking about, yeah, so, you know, what's most important? So if you think about your pencil, so especially this is a little bit different when you think about computer mapping because you can zoom easily. But if you're mapping on a piece of paper, if I have a my pencil, my good mechanical pencil is 0.5 millimeter wide, right? And if it's a 1 to 24,000 map, how wide is that line on the ground? Let's do the math. It's 12 meters wide, right? So my pencil, so who has a mechanical, anyone have a mechanical pencil? Right here. So this mechanical pencil, you know, that little, that pencil tip, if I'm mapping on one of these air photos that might be 1 to 24,000 or 1 to 25,000 or 1 to 40,000, you know, it's really wider than this room is how big the line is when I draw it. And so it makes a point that you can't represent things too fine. And so you always have to make this calculation first because then you can say, okay, what I'm, I can't go too fine. Or if it's one to 500,000, then, you know, it's huge, right? It's like 250 meters wide. So then it's like 
bigger than ITB campus, right? So, so this is a key thing because, uh, and for computer mapping, you know, we can zoom in like Google Earth, you can zoom into one building, zoom back out to the whole city, but you need to kind of represent things at a constant level of detail so that it's not mixed, where one place has lots of detail and the other place is just one huge one line or something. And so it's an important consideration to map without zooming too much back and forth. And then the other thing is even coverage. So the psychology of mapping is you, you cover everywhere, you check everywhere. And if there's nothing there, then usually I say, well, did you map? You didn't see anything there? You always put something everywhere. And even if it seems uh, unimportant, you find the most important thing and map it. And then you cover. And that way you discover things. And then you try to be as provide as much detail as you can relative to the scale consideration. So other mantras, so you always, every line is meaningful. You be consistent, have quality control. So if you don't know, you have doubt, you may put dash. You know, if you are certain, you make a line, you can question. So we never want to forget that. And then, especially when you're mapping on paper, you want to have the biggest lines be the most important lines and the thinnest and dashed lines be the least important. So what this data ink ratio means is if you have all the ink of your paper is, is the total, then mo and then when you say, well, how much ink is in the data, you want this to almost be all the ink of the map. So in other words, if you have some big decoration, like you know how sometimes a map has a huge north arrow that's very fancy, this is like a decoration, right? And so your eyes drawn to the decoration, not to the line that maybe is more important, like the fault. Or that's a lot of times why when we make a map with faults, the faults are thick and black because they're the most important things. So our eyes are drawn to where the ink is. So this is kind of the cartography of any map, but especially for active faults. And then, of course, when – so this firm was my class, you know, so I have to tell everyone – be neat, you know, try, use the eraser. Okay, so this is maybe the most important slide, so try to uh, be ready to take it in. So what I was saying before is there's many different ways to map. So this example is, here's some place, okay? It has uh, some underlying geology, the beds are dipping, there's a river, there's some terrace with some drainages cutting into the terrace. Then there's a bigger tributary. There's some landslide here, some weird thing. I don't know what this is. So this is the place. This is the na nature, like what we see. So you can represent it with, you know, many different kinds of maps. So the one we might, for the geologists in the audience, the most usual one would be geologic maps. So here you show, okay, unit, you know, mudstone conglomerate, mudstone, siltstone, sandstone. So, and then you map, okay, this, uh, you know, landslide. So, that's fine. Geologic maps are useful. But maybe really we want to do something like a morphologic map, which is no geology at all. It's just the changes in the shape of the landscape. So, for example, this cliff, the steep cliff right here, we might choose to map it. And then here's this little quick change in slope here on the edge of the drainage, this line right there, okay? And then these numbers here are the the angle, so how steep the slope is. So it's not like the dip of the layering, it's the, the uh, slope steepness. And so sometimes this is really good, and especially I think this is good for active fault mapping because, you know, we're looking for pieces of the landscape that may come into a fault zone and then are offset and leave it. But, you know, they may be very discontinuous, and so you have to just very carefully map all that you see, and you're kind of idealizing. You're taking away all the trees and all the buildings, and they're just looking at the shape of the landscape. And maybe then, by this idealization, you see the disruption that's the fault. And so this is the idea, and I'll show some examples uh, from Gayatri's mapping where we're trying this because it's so hard, you know, you don't have this straight line of the fault from 35 millimeters a year in the desert, you know, here, Java, you're looking at 0.1 or 1 millimeter a year in the tropics, right? So 
going to be different, but you have to start by mapping. So this is a good one. Other ones are morphogenetic, so this is an interpretation of how these features formed, like this surface, highly weathered mudstone. This thing is a terrace. Process maps, so what happens over these surfaces? How does material move? And then hydrologic maps, so, uh, you know, what, what, how does the water move on or under the surface? So I like this because it shows it kind of liberating it, it frees you to do different kinds of mapping. And as a geologist working on active faults, you can choose what's most important. You just have to be consistent. Okay. So any questions? Okay. So let's look here some different maps. And not these are not all exactly the same as my example. But you know, one thing is the Japanese have beautiful active fault maps. They're my favorite. And so I, I'll just show some Japanese maps to um, give some examples of how they represent faults and fault zones. So uh, here's one. This is from, most of these are Honshu, the on land, like median tectonic zone or some of the other faults. Uh, but what you see is, you know, it has topographic base map. There's not much mapping of the bedrock. They do map the young feature like this is a landslide. But then they map the, you know, they show also these landforms. So what, what would these be? Alluvial sand. Yeah. So they're showing some landforms here. And then they're, they're showing the, the young deposits, basically the quaternary alluvial units that come from this river. So they have, this would be M, this is like M1, M2. So different age terraces coming down. And then L, I'm not sure what L is. This is maybe more of a basin unit. And so, so they have the geomorphology, these landforms, the, the young deposits, and then they have the, the, the faults. In this case, a fold. So one key thing that's important is to have, I like to think in my mind of layers of interpretation. So the bottom layer is the aerial photograph or the digital elevation model. There's no interpretation, just a picture. No human has made any, you know, interpretation of it. It's just what's there. Then the next level up might be something like the morphologic map, where it's just shape. And then the next level up would say, all right, so I see, you know, this feature is disrupted. I'm going to put a fault through it. So that's you know, going up in levels from observations to interpretation. So it's always good to keep them separate because we're always tempted. Okay, somebody says, well, where's the fault? Where's the fault? So immediately, you know, you think, okay, I have to start drawing faults. But I think you have to first show what's there, and then you can prove why you would draw the fault only after you've documented the main features. Because we know, you know, it might be easy to see the fault in some places, but in other places it's uncertain, and it's the last, thing you draw as well, it could be here. Uh, and so I think it's important in your mind and even in the mapping to have multiple layers. So comments? Anyone good at reading uh, kanji? Mm -hmm. I, I can, but uh, so here's another example. This is not a great map, but you see uh, some traces they show but then they also show some nice, you know, important little geologic cross-sections. So we're still using our geology to represent what we see, but usually it's a very detailed kind of a cross-section. And you can also see that they really, they don't care about the bedrock. It's just all gray. Who cares, you know, some shifts or something. But what we really care about is the fault zone and the younger younger units, uh, which is because of that's the question that we're asking is the effect on the young deposits. So here's another active fault map. This is this place uh, in uh, along this fault called the Tikio Fault. So actually, let's go forward to the, this is an aerial photograph along that fault zone. So the main fault, the road is right on the fault. And this is some pond here. And the, so the fault goes along. And it, it cuts this terrace system here. And look, so, you know, that picture was taken from over here. Here's the pond. So the road goes right through here. And, and only
only with careful mapping did they see, oh, okay, it looks like this terrace comes in and it stops, and we, ha and we could pick it up here again. And, you know, so, uh, you know, Japan doesn't quite have the precipitation and heavy vegetation of Indonesia, but like Indonesia, has lots of urbanization, lots of agriculture. And so, you know, it still takes this careful, you know, looking through the, the human signal to find the geomorphic features that may be affected by the faulting. And, and so one tool they use and they also present is kind of a nice style is they publish the stereo pairs. And so, you know, if, if you have a stereo viewer, you can look in, in stereo and, and see three dimensionally this place. And it's easier than to see, oh, look at this stream channel comes in and it bends. There's another one that comes here and bends. So there are some offset streams right in here that just from one air photo is hard to see until I point them out. But when you look in, in stereo, you can see the valleys warping around. So that's this area right here. And these are these offsets that they mapped right there. So see, they show dash the, the valleys. So, you know, my point is just to show some examples of the styles of mapping. Because, you know, you may say, well, what do I do? Well, start making maps to look like this. And that's that's the step in the right direction. And, it, you know, it's easy when the, the five millimeter a year, or 10 millimeter a year slip rate falls, but still you can do it anywhere. And this uh, approach is, is uh, you know, it's kind of like an, this is a style of mapping that comes more from engineering geology, you know. So if you have colleagues or some of you are trained as geotechnical engineers, this is maybe more routine. And these kinds of maps are useful for more than just faulting studies. It's good at documenting landslides or other features, right? So this is just an example. This book is full of these, all these kinds of different map types. And um, then this is... a uh, another paper and we have these pdfs we'll put them online but this paper is called systematic mapping of geomorphology so there's people who spend time thinking about how to do this okay keep going so here's some examples so here we were you know Gayatri was this is opak fault so near Jogjakarta, Jogja earthquake maybe was along the opak fault where is the Opak fault? We don't know, right? <laughs> so if you want to try to find it in the landscape, you can go drive around, but maybe you should use your stereo pairs and start mapping and start looking and looking for disruptions. So, you know, we still didn't exactly find the Opak fault, but we find some candidate terrace surfaces. So she shows, see this symbol here is for flat areas. So these flat areas are coming in and you know, they end abruptly. Um, here's a cliff here. These uh, lines like this, uh, this line with teeth on either side is the ridge line. And so it's it seems really basic, but it's an abstraction. It sort of pulls away from the complex view of the topography, the main features of the topography. And if the fault is there and it's significantly affecting the landscape, you would find it because you would see that there was strange breaks or unusual discontinuities in these landscape elements. So this is an approach I strongly advocate. And it doesn't have to be high tech, you know, just pencil and aerial photograph and, you know, some maybe transparency. That's all you need. You don't have to, you know, worry about fancy computers or anything. Just get to work and then you can, after the fact, compile so this is one example and still work in progress. So, you know, just showing, I meant to show it mostly to give an example that anyone, we, you can do this, just start working, get, and this is kind of like your language. So what are the graphical words you're going to use to represent what's there? So Opak fault, here's the Kulan Progo. So here you see the main river. We can see some terraces that she's identified next to the fault. We go up a slope. So see, I can read the graphical language right away. I can say, okay, so this is a flat area. 
she goes up some steep slope and then there's another flat area but it looks like it's sloping a little bit this direction and so here would be the uh, that's this shallow gradient symbol and then purple so what's purple I actually just bedrock older terrace yeah so so you can see this is the the raw material that you would use to make one of those nice Japanese style maps you know, she can next digitize and clean up, maybe put it on topographic base maps instead of the air photo. Here's another one, Probolingo. Pasiran, oh. Yeah, that's what I thought. So, but, so here are some strange, you know, you see these rivers are flowing this way, and then there's, there's a change in drainage network this direction, and that's because there's the fault right in here. And it's also stepping, so it's not, it's not straight. And there's also some really interesting, unusual kind of depressions along this zone. So again, just showing this is the, one of the early strategies, just mapping what's there. Uh, and then you go in the field and check, and ultimately you have a trench site here somewhere, right, in this picture. Um, somewhere over here. Yeah, so, but we'll see also, when we come to the lectures about trenching, this is the early step, you know, first thing is mapping around the site. This also provides justification for where to put a trench. So this is a, from the McAlpin Paleo Seismology book, it gives this long table about, you know, different remote sensing methods, stereo aerial photography, so he says, you know, it's widely available and inexpensive and you know but there's some dis disadvantages free satellite images google earth you know available worldwide but you know it depends where you are sometimes high resolution actually this is older this book is 2006 maybe and so he says resolution varies best in north america one meter now it's global almost everywhere 50 centimeters so you know, five years of accumulation of imagery. Then he says, so topography, different resolutions, 90 meters, 30 meters, and then my favorite, LIDAR, high resolution topography is one of our best tools, but it's also quite expensive to collect. So, so that's uh, kind of mapping and, and data, and uh, just a few more comments about what what we might do with all of it. So, any questions? Okay, so once you have faults, fault map, let's say, so then what do we do with it? So I know uh, Mudrik is quite familiar with GEM, but uh, this is an activity, and many um, also geological surveys will want to build active fault maps, and so the modern activities kind of accumulate active fault maps globally to use them as part of a uh, uh, fault model for seismic hazard assessment. So global earthquake model guides are uh, trying to provide a kind of guideline so that everyone's fault model, fault maps are consistent. And so there's a new, you see just this new guideline uh, just this month. And they, uh, I won't go into the detail, but just to give a flavor of what they've designed. So one thing is to go from you know, actually, we are even over here on the left. We're still in morphology. So, you know, we make some observations, and then we make interpretation, like, hey, fault trace, fault trace. Then you keep going on interpretation. You say, okay, section, section, fault, fault, and then 3D fault source. So there's a long line of progressive interpretation that we can use to build fault models for seismic hazard. And, you know, the part that we're really worried about now is this early part, you know, where are the fault traces? But it's part of a longer sequence of activities. And um, so this is simple view. Then here's the complicated view. So, you know, this is folds and faults, or this is points and then this is faults. And so kind of, you know, what do you do to accumulate this information digitally, uniformly, so that then you can build a fault source polygon? And this just shows the example of the kind of attributes that 
you would want to have for these faults. So, you know, obvious features like the, you know, the three-dimensionality of it, but also the kinematics. And then down here, some of our information we care about, like the if we know the recurrence interval for earthquakes along it, the time of the last earthquake, but then also who who did the work and notes. So it's it's very time consuming, but by this uniform collection of information, then it's useful for everyone. So I think I just bring this up because it, there's kind of a overall structure that any of our mapping can plug into. So at the end of my lecture, now we can get to work to have some fun. Okay, so the fault might really look like this, right? And so in my opinion, it's extremely important to show the breaks. Nothing there, maybe something over here. And then, okay, maybe there's something here and something here. So this is just what you see. Uh, and then let's say there's something over there. Now, when you compile, and a lot of times uh, there's a, like a way of thinking, like the philosophy of mapping, which is that, that the lines should be smooth. And so they'll connect them. So let's try if I go to the, uh, let me try ink color blue. So the compiler may go, oh, just go a straight line through there. It's continuous. And then they may even wrap it around like this, right? Or I didn't quite get that right. Um, so, so that's really not realistic to, especially those curves because maybe the fault really doesn't curve, it doesn't connect, it just steps. So that's why I always, I, I back off, you know. Now the, the other, however, uh, arrow options, you know, what I'm looking for is, uh, let's say highlighter. So if you compile though, you know, maybe you're, you're compiling at one to 500,000, so really the line is quite thick. So then it doesn't, you can't represent those individual traces. So on a, on a, on a summary map, you may just simply have to, to connect them. Because you can't draw the fine step overs, you can't represent them. They just lump together. So part of this mapping then depends on scale. You know, because then I could even zoom in to, uh, let's say, pen and get a different color let's try a purple so you know right in this area if I take this little place and I come over here I might find that it's extremely complex you know many you know small features coming along and maybe two zones you know so it's completely dependent on map scale I think. However, I, I still always say, when possible, it's okay to stop, start again. And then as you are saying, well, you know, perhaps we can use more information, which means, you know, solid line, okay, approximately located. Then let's say it goes under some, but maybe we, we, in color, there's some, Oh, sorry, in color, maybe there's green. So let's say there's a river valley here, river channel right there. And in here, then I might, da I might dot it, sorry. So I would dot because I know it's coming through. Oh, here it is again. So basic cartography rules, you know, for for representing these features, but as much detail as you can. Because again, the, the you know, other person might be in a hurry, and so they would just say, well, that's just all right there, just one fault, don't worry about it, right? Which is okay, sometimes you have to do that, because you, you're compiling and you're compiling, you mapped it at one to six thousand, but 
you know, it needs to go to a one to a hundred thousand map, then you just have to go through. But in my opinion, especially the earlier levels of interpretation are as detailed as possible. And then you can generalize, generalize, generalize. Great question. Good philosophical point. Okay, other questions? So, okay, well, let's, let's play around with the GIS a little bit. So, if you look in the folder I gave you, there's two, two folders. So, you, most people said they're basically familiar with GIS. So, the first one, let's just take a tour of the base map Lembong exercise. Double click on the Lembong GIS, uh, ARC project. And so that actually helped to build this data stack for me from data that uh, Mujer gave us. So thanks. So remember my demo, what my rules yesterday were just, uh, if you want me to slow down, raise your hand. Otherwise, uh, I'll assume you're keeping up. 